I was having a conversation with someone the other day about Nintendo and you know, we love to throw shade at them at the moment because they shut down Yuzu. They will sue anyone that moves in the wrong direction, but you have to hand it to them. There were lots of handhelds back in the day in the 80s, but they are the company that made handhelds what they are today. And they've been pretty cutting edge. I assure the Switch is underpowered, but it was pretty revolutionary for its time. And the Game Boy Color is no different, you know. Perfect ergonomics for a vertical device, great games, and two, Nintendo's probably own regret is the fact that these cartridges last and work so well, and hence this video today. So in the spirit of throwing shade at Nintendo, today I'm looking at a fake Game Boy. This is the funny playing GBC. Okay, but before we get ahead of ourselves, a quick word from today's sponsor. Hello, let me tell you about PCBWay. It's today's sponsor. They do a myriad of things, CNC machining, 3D printing, and they can manufacture your prototype PCB. They have a wonderful tool on their website which allows you to order your PCB to spec the way you want it. So for all your nerdy projects to build fancy electronic things, Think of PCB way. So standout features. One of the main things is original hardware is getting hard to come by. I mean, when I started this, I could find a Game Boy Color, a original Game Boy Color on Facebook Marketplace for like 800 Rand. And now, you know, they're 2,500 Rand, 3,000 Rand. I saw one for 5,000 Rand. Prices are getting ridiculous. And to be able to get one as a new one that feels and looks like a Game Boy Color is fantastic. So that's one of the standout features. And then I'm not sure if buying it as a, as a kit is for legal reasons, but it was pretty easy to assemble and you can watch my video on the assembly. I'll put the link in the description below. It has an excellent speaker and we'll look at that just now. Funny playing, I've started to provide a cover strip, a back cover strip for this unsightly part of the bottom of the screen. A lot of people were complaining that in, in previous build videos. And then the function buttons and the action buttons are damn near like exact to original hardware. You know, the, the plastic's not exactly the same, obviously but it does feel pretty close to OG hardware. I think it's a standout feature, the fact that it has USB-C charging. And with that, even though it's a tiny little battery in the back here, um, excellent battery life. And then we'll look at that just now, the OSD or the function menu is pretty well thought out. And any critical issues, I would say the D-pad is subpar. It's not as good as OG hardware. I find in the game that I'm gonna use today, Quix doesn't feel very accurate, but then when I test Shrek, I'm able to do all my fighting moves. So, you know, even though it doesn't feel perfect, it is working pretty well. And then I did say it's easy to assemble, but you do have to assemble it. And I think that is an issue for a lot of people. So I do want to kind of drop this Easter egg is that I'm not, I'm not gonna do flashcards today because it's quite an investment to get all the flashcards uh, because I wanna buy a bunch and do a whole video just testing flashcards on the funny playing GBC. But to be honest, right now, I'm just excited to put the word out there, especially I live in a, a, a town just outside of Cape Town, which is the main city near me. And uh, just put the word out there that I'm looking for cartridges because uh, I'm excited to collect cartridges. So just immediately doing an audio test there. I actually haven't played it at full volume for an extended period of time. And it's the first time that I've heard a little bit of a rattle. So I have had people one or two comments on the build video saying, I've installed the speaker and there's quite a bit of rattling. There's a little, little gasket that you get with the speaker and it is quite difficult to get that in perfectly. So that's one of the little build quirks. But uh, I have noticed a little bit of a rattle here and I did put my gasket in pretty well. Apart from that, I think the audio is really well-rounded. It's quite a big speaker and you've got all these little holes around the speaker. So you're get, getting quite a lot of transparency from the speaker as opposed to, you know, the OG Game Boy that just had those little slits. This is getting a modern speaker with all that transparency and you're getting really good sound, like just an even spread of sound, even like a little bit of bass in that quick soundtrack. So I am a fan of the audio on the funny playing GBC. So in my analysis of the D-pad, I'm playing quicks and I just find, you know, in those little quick moves to make those little towers and to try and trap the bad guy, um, I find that that accuracy is a little bit lacking. Um, I found it more enjoyable to play on the OG Game Boy. Um, and so I just find the D-pad is not quite there in terms of that kind of gameplay. 
And then my little Shrek game, I used this to demonstrate, you know, if you need to like mush the buttons and do some fighting moves, it does do that. So I did find that doing a jump move, so you have to push, press up to jump. Sometimes there was a delay in the res response to that, but my sort of down and side to fart and the down and forward to shoot a little spark, those moves actually worked. So it's, again, not the great steep pad, but you are gonna get along fine with this D-pad. I also really like, this is a retro thing. So this is like something that's not actually good, but makes it feel like the OG hardware is the fact that these are those rubber mushy buttons and that they're slightly sunken in and hard to press. So <laughs> even though that's like not a good thing, um, it's a nice retro feeling and close to original hardware. And to me, the action buttons seem great. Um, you know, body scrape, because of the type of plastic, you're not gonna notice a lot of that body scrape. You know, sometimes you, you get that powder on the side of the buttons. I don't think you're gonna get a lot of that with this, because it's almost like, this plastic's almost like Tupperware. If, if you like the Game Boy Color and you remember the Game Boy Color, you'll remember Tupperware. And it's that kind of plastic. It's a softish plastic and a, a smooth, plastic, which I don't think you're gonna get a lot of body scrape, but apart, you know, other than that, I just think the response is great, they feel good, and they're, you know, they're slightly bigger than our usual ones we get on these retro consoles. And now, something that I get a little bit of criticism for is my shake test. People often go, well, that is a stupid test, and it is, but I do it anyway. The reason I do it is just, I think it reflects a little bit of love from the people who created it. Now, considering I built this, there was a lot of love. <laughs> Obviously, this doesn't have shoulder buttons, and that's where the shake comes from on the RG35XX+. Plus. Um, great name, by the way. I just think, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot to stop the rattle. And um, here we go. That I'm gonna put the same amount of like noise boost. So I have to boost the signal to get it sounding like something to your ears. Obviously this thing is pretty much silent. Um, and I, I feel like that just shows, you know, that whoever designed this thing was looking to make it feel like a premium device once you put it together. By the way, a review coming of the RG35XX Plus I'm trying to be objective with those devices. Okay, so I want to do a quick little screen test. So let's, we've got to press in this button to get the OSD, the function, and then let's, you press the A button to get it to full brightness. Okay, so that's full brightness. Let's say save. All right, press the multi-purpose button thingy again. All right, so it is peaking on my camera. So I'm going to just adjust the camera now. Okay, so you're gonna have to adjust your eyes because now it's been brighter for the, for the video and now I'm, I've dimmed the, the, the camera to adjust to the brighter screen now. And so this is how it looks with studio lights, um, ambient lights, all that sort of thing. So in the bright lit, brightly lit room, I was getting perfect, you know, I could see it nicely. Now, obviously in the dark room, it is very, very bright. This is super bright in, let's say, sleep, uh, sitting in bed and playing some Tetris while you watch a series. Let's bring that backlight. I, th I think if you go all the way, it switches it off. No, it doesn't switch it off, so that's cool. That is very, very dim. This device is going to be excellent in low lit situations. It's, I would say, you know, bedtime play in the dark. This screen is going to be really nice. You know, maybe it, once it goes, it's midnight and everyone's sleeping and all the lights are off or there's a power failure and it's completely black around you. Then it might seem a little bit bright, but overall I think this is, it's not the dimmest screen that I've put through the studio, but it, but I think it's really nice. Anyway, that's enough about that. Yeah, you see now, once I switch the lights on. All right, so pocketability. This is the best and most scientific test of the whole video. The nice thing that you've got here is the fact that there's no joysticks to hook onto your pockets, and it's got this very smooth bulge. So if you put it head first with a cartridge in it, and you go here, yeah, I've got fairly tight jeans on today. Obviously that does stick out. The RG35XX, so very pocketable. Let's go with a PSP and uh, yeah, gonna get a decent bulge there. RG351P, that's, okay, that's, okay, that's actually really nice. So, uh, 
pocketable. Yeah, not amazingly pocketable, but but it's pocketable. And then compared to the RG Nano. All right. So let's compare it to something like the RG35 XX Plus. Great name, by the way. 187 grams, 189 grams. So heavier uh, without a cartridge. 187, 170. So the cartridge adds a fair amount of weight. 123, 189, 201 grams. So that's heavier. All right, pointless exercise over. All right, so let's quickly talk about the feeling in my hand. And um, it feels fantastic. The, the plastic is really nice. So I am a huge fan of the matte plastic on the RP2S, the Retro Pocket 2S. This is just heaven. This thing feels premium. I still think this is the best device of 2023. This, this is not quite there, it's just, you know, this is very subjective. This is just a feeling that I have in the hand. So the, the plastic is nice though. It's got a good pla like matte plastic feel to it, which I, I like. What you're getting with this is just retro feels. Like this feels like a Game Boy Color, which it should do. It feels really good. Um, and the weight distribution. So I went on and on about this in the olden days with the RG280V and you know other devices. The weight distribution is excellent. So if you put your fingers there, it balances perfectly. Uh, a little bit further up and it starts to drop. So what's nice is you put your fingers up at the top, just, just above the bulge, and then it kind of drops into your bottom fingers and you play. Like all, like this. The weight distribution is excellent and that really feels good. Yeah, it's a Game Boy Color, man. There's just something about it. And then overall build quality, considering I built it out of five, I give it a six. <laughs> I'm such a dumbass. Um, seriously though, I think Funny Playing did a fantastic job with this. I think they are just my heroes for even inventing this little thing. Yes. Okay, we're gonna do a little audio test and I think we're gonna do it between the Mew Mini Plus and the original Game Boy. Um, I unfortunately don't have a Game Boy Color here to do the test with, but let's do quicks. So the Funny Playing GBC, softer than the Mew Mini Plus, but a little bit of low end there. It's like surprising how much low end there is in there. And then the OG Game Boy disappointing us all with terrible audio. <laughs> so good. And then battery life, I haven't done a full battery life workup on this, but it has an 80, 1800 milliamp hour battery, but I can say this thing lasts for ages, and that's because you just switch it off when you're done. You know, it's the same as a Mio Mini Plus where you just power off when you're done. You don't have to leave it in sleep mode. And so that is a huge plus, and, and real life experience of this is that the battery life is ample. And you know, if you're a commuter, so if you're someone who wants to get this for on the train or the bus, you don't need a spare battery. You just need a power bank because it's USB-C. So in terms of ergonomics, the most ergonomic vertical, vertical device I can think of is the RG405E, and a device that I don't go back to enough because it is such a nice device, this. Like, we're lucky that Gamma OS came around because of the over-sharpening and that, because it would have been a shame for people not to enjoy this device. This is ergonomically just fantastic. Not much of a shake either. Anyway, I digress. Ergonomically, this is the best vertical device probably ever made. I mean, it's more ergonomic than the OG. Wow, that's a thing to say. More ergonomic than the OG Game Boy. Great buttons. Doesn't have like retro feeling buttons. I mean, they are retro, but um, doesn't feel like OG hardware, should I say. Excellent shoulder buttons, you know, the way that your fingers curl around the back. Very, very, very good ergonomics. I want to put that in our minds and then we pick this up. And so, because I don't want to oversell the ergonomics. I think, I said in another video, I said this is the Jesus of ergonomic vertical devices and I, I, <laughs> I get excited sometimes. And I think what I was thinking is, is that in terms of pocketability, 
and ergonomics. This thing really is because the RG405E isn't pocketable at all. Like you can't put it in your pocket uh, if you, unless you want to look like a ridiculous idiot. This is perfect. I have enjoyed playing it, but it is a strange way to hold a device. You either hold it like this or you cradle it, cradle it in your fingers and you hold it like this. This little bulge does make it feel really nice to hold. Oh, let's just put a cartridge in to kind of give us the real world thing. That that also helps with the balance. So, because then, then, you know, the thing is it's a compromise because then you look at the Mio Mini Plus that doesn't have a chin and like in my, my other video for this, I dramatically dropped it on the table because, you know, where do you hold it? And that kind of, you know, may, makes my point is where do you hold this thing? There's nowhere to put your pinky. Whereas here, um, it's got a place to put your pinky. So that's good. I think, you know, a small compromise has been made for the sake of pocketability, but in return, you get one of the most ergonomic pocketable vertical devices and it holds up today. That's what's so amazing about this. This is a very, very old design, 1998, bloody hell. And then aesthetics, look how pretty. <laughs> you know, that is the thing about Nintendo. After all these years, their devices continue to look great. This is a mainstream iconic device. If I show this to someone who isn't into gaming, who doesn't give a shit about gaming, um, they will recognize this. Unless you're my wife who had absolutely no experience with gaming whatsoever and doesn't even know who Nintendo are. Look at this thing. Like, the design is just lovely, and I'm a sucker for these transparent black devices. They provided the, I don't know how legal it is, but these stickers from the olden days, you know, like my OG Game Boy has got the old sticker there. So they've got the old service center number there. They've got the, the, the back panel sticker there, even a serial number <laughs> sticker. And it just adds to that authenticity and it gives you those retro feels. I wish this wasn't orange, but it, I think, you know what I must do? I must put some electrical black tape there. I think that'll finish that off nicely. I haven't actually mentioned this in this video yet, but aesthetically the screen is bigger than the original Game Boy Color. And so you're getting this beautiful large screen. The setup experience, watch my video where I built it, but the setup was interesting in that there were a few moments where it was scary. There were like these scary moments where I wasn't too sure what was going on. And I mentioned, you know, some of these things, the people have been doing these build videos for a very long time. I'll tell you it's easy. And it is easy, but if you are someone who's never built anything, has never picked up a soldering iron, has never done any electronic stuff, this is difficult. I think so. I think it's difficult for newbies. Once you get over those difficult bits, so putting in the screen, I gave very clear instructions in that video of how to put that screen in and to overcome your fear on that. And then just the PCB, how the PCB goes in. When you first put it in, it doesn't just click into place it kind of rocks there and doesn't feel like it's supposed to be there even. Um, and so I show you in that video where to start doing the screws, give it enough tension until it's stable and then move on to the next step. So if you follow those steps, it is easy. So let's quickly go into the OSD or the system menu. We've got the backlight, which brightens. You use the B button, the A button. So A will make it brighter. Just make it sort of there. Volume, again, A and B display. So this is quite cool. So there is integer scaled with no filter. There's integer scaling with a pixel filter on it, which I think a lot of people will like. I kind of like that sort of thing. But the thing is, you want the full screen. And so I wish they had a full screen P mode, you know, full screen with the pixels. That would be ideal. Anyway, I'm going to leave it on full screen because I just prefer it that way. Here's where you change your core. So there's a core for Game Boy and there's a core for Game Boy Color. And so you'll switch it here to Game Boy and then turn it off and switch it back on. So I'll show you how to do that now. Color palettes are relevant uh, when we switch to the Game Boy core. FrameX fixes an issue where there's like certain overlay sprites that are supposed to be transparent. Then just leave it on. If you see any issues, you can switch it off. Ca color fix is You'll see there the colors changing in the background. 
This is if you see a major issue with colors. So I turned it on for Shrek and the whole screen almost goes one color. So it's, it's for specific games where you're seeing color deviations, you can switch that on. This is the speed of the emulation and the music in the background on that. I haven't really messed with that, so I don't really care about that, but you could if you really wanna get it as accurate to the OG hardware, you can sit with the Game Boy Color and adjust the speed until it sounds and looks like the original hardware, and then I'm going to save. So there we go, we save, now we press the little this little multi-function button has got a press feature. So there you'll see the OSD go on, now it's off. Now what we're gonna do is just switch it off. Because remember I switched to the Game Boy Core. Now we're gonna switch it back on. There we go, that's pretty cool. I do miss the ding. This is kind of it, hey? Like you can, I think if I was to do the Game Boy thing, I would go there. So like X4P with the pixelation. Now the color palettes, I'm just, like, I'm not a huge fan. Like, none of them really float my boats. Um, I saw Taki Udon likes them, but I'm just not a fan. I think two is good enough. It's not, like, it doesn't do that green, you know? Uh, but that's good enough. So if I was trying to do Game Boy, I think I would go with that. Um, color palette two and uh, with, the, with the integer scaling. That kind of feels like a Game Boy, and I might leave that on there to play Tetris later. So this is the part of the video where I say major competing devices and the only, I mean, you can make an argument for, you know, the Mi Mini Plus and all those kind of things, but the only real competing device, because this takes cartridges, none of those take cartridges, is the analog pockets. Now, I don't own an analog pocket because it is just very expensive and therein lies the answer to my question is, this is the poor man's analog pocket. And I really think that the word needs to get out about this more because the analog pocket is so popular and it is a beautiful item to own, but so is this. If you compare it to the original hardware, which is the other competing device, the prices are going up, it's getting more rare and more scarce, and this has a nice big clear screen to play your Game Boy Color games on. And so I really feel like this deserves more love because it is exceptional in the market. The only downside for you know, noobs and that is that you have to build it yourself. But just give it to a nerd in your life like me. We'll build it for you. You've, everybody's got one of us in your life. And then pricing, I worked it out at about $84 from China to year with shipping. They use, I think they use Buffalo. So the shipping was quite good and quite affordable. I didn't have any import tax and it got to me and I built it. So that was really nice. The pricing is pretty good, $84. That's about the price of a Miu Mini Plus, maybe a little bit more. If you wanna buy the OG hardware, that's $200. And I haven't checked the price of the analog pocket, but I'll put that on the screen. This is just really well positioned in the markets. And you know, there's not much to dislike here, apart from the less than optimal D-pad and the fact that you have to build it. And what you're getting in return is this hobby, going to thrift stores, finding cartridges. Shrek is a terrible game, by the way. <laughs> I just used it for this video. So that's what you're getting. What's next? Um, crotch time was done, 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 and done. Ba-ding!